Now we're going to tell you of the experimental data found within the Morth paper. These graphs from figure one of the Morth paper depict the preparation experiments to set up the crystallization process. The bottom graph has the ATPase in the membrane with rubidium present and no magnesium tetrafluoride. The results are consistent with that of potassium, verifying that rubidium is a valid substitute for potassium. The middle graph is in the presence of magnesium tetrafluoride and shows that the occlusion is the same in both the presence and absence of ATP. These findings prove that magnesium tetrafluoride stabilizes the ATPase in one state, a necessity for crystallization. In the top graph, the same parameters are used. However, the protein has been taken out of the membrane. This experiment was conducted to make sure the protein acted the same way in and out of the membrane in a stable form. Shown in the rib ribbon model in purple, the ions used for crystallization were not potassium, but rubidium. Potassium does not form a stable enough interaction for crystallography results, so rubidium had to be substituted. In the experiment, the rubidiums were shown to occupy the same binding pockets as potassium, so it was deemed an adequate replacement. As mentioned previously, occlusion is imperative for ion transport across the membrane and defined as isolation of ions from both the extracellular and cytoplasmic fluids. Shown here by converting the ribbon model to an atomic surface model, you can see that the rubidium ions are clearly enveloped by the protein, indicating the property of occlusion. A closer look at the potassium binding pocket shows five residues that coordinate the two ions. These residues are serine 775, glutamate 779, asparagine 776, aspartate 804, and glutamate 327. Primarily, these residues use carbonyls except for serine, which uses a hydroxyl to coordinate these ions. These residues from three different transmembrane helices, alpha 4, 5, and 6, labeled here. It follows that any changes in these helices will affect binding affinity of the ions. This is a view to help you visualize this coordination system. Shown here is the coordination of the magnesium tetrafluoride in the P domain. As you can see, beside it, the magnesium that usually helps coordinate the ATP is present to also help to coordinate this phosphate analog. The residues that coordinate magnesium tetrafluoride are believed to be the same ones that would coordinate the gamma phosphate. Most of the residues are negatively charged to interact with the magnesium, which in turn coordinates the phosphate. The aspartate that is to be phosphorylated is at position 369. The C-terminal switch? Shown here is the C-terminal switch. It consists of the last five residues on alpha subunits M10 transmembrane helix. These residues are K-E-T-Y-Y. These residues have been shown to have a close association with the alpha M5 transmembrane helix, which as you remember is necessary for the coordination of potassium and most likely sodium ions. It is believed that two of the three sodium ions share the same binding pocket as potassium. Additionally, there are five arginine residues concentrated near the C-terminus. Shown here are the alpha M8 and alpha M9 transmembrane helices, between which the third sodium ion is believed to be coordinated. As one would expect, these positively charged residues will produce an electrosensitive region in part of the protein that is very close to the cytoplasm. Therefore, it is easy to postulate that the changes in the electrical gradient between the extracellular fluid and the cytoplasm will induce changes in these residues. Shown here is an example of what would happen if the cytoplasm, which is normally negative, would become positive. This would repulse the concentrated positive charges near the C-terminus, pushing the helix down away from the positive charge. During this, it would pull down on the C-terminal switch, which is attached to the alpha M5 helix as stated earlier. Thus, changes in the electrical gradients produces changes in the ability to bind sodium. Shown in this graph is the phosphorylation activity relative to the sodium concentration. 
Both a normal sodium potassium pump and a pump that has been mutated for the deletion of the five terminal residues were used in this experiment. The mutated pump is shown by the open circles. This graph clearly shows that there was a substantial increase in the concentration at which phosphorylation activity was at 50%. This indicates that without the C-terminus, the pump's affinity for sodium is decreased. Furthermore, it is shown that the mutation has only a very little effect on the potassium activity. This coupled with the sodium experiment shows that the mutation doesn't cause a change in the equilibrium state between E1 and E2, but just affects the sodium affinity. The next graph shows that the mutant has an increased affinity for ATP binding. It is important to note that the ATP binds preferentially in the E1 conformation. The final graph shows that the mutant has a decreased affinity for vanadate, a phosphate analog. Vanadate only binds to the protein in the E2 state. This is interesting because these two experiments would suggest that the equilibrium moves slightly towards the E1 state. Interestingly, this is the state in which sodium would enter the binding site. This strongly supports that the loss of the C-terminus has a direct effect on sodium affinity. Thank you.